So, um, as you can see from this picture, I've basically been taking one for the team and been wandering around paradise for a couple of years in Costa Rica. It's, it's been rough. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to do is understand a bit more about the poaching that's going on over there in relation to turtle eggs. Um, I'm just going to give you a very quick crash course in turtles. I probably you all know what turtle is. Um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to this actual presentation, um, they're an ancient marine reptile that have... Um, large clutch sizes. So basically every season they have to come onto the beaches at night, conveniently, thank you, um, and start laying eggs. And they, large, they lay a lot of eggs at once. So we're looking at around 100 eggs per clutch. Um, these are fairly sweeping generalizations. Most species have different clutch sizes and things like that, but we can discuss that at a later date. But the main things you need to know is that they come onto beaches across the tropics and they lay a lot of eggs in seasons. The importance of sea turtles, um, they're not just pretty, they're not just a charismatic animal, um, they are actually very important ecosystem regulators. And so being such large animals, they eat a lot. Um, because they eat a lot, they actually have an influence on their habitats. Um, with the case of green turtles, for example, in this picture, you can see that they're eating seagrass and they're actually really important regulators of that habitat. Um, because they lay eggs on beaches, they also uh, transfer nutrients from the marine environment to the terrestrial. Um, this is important in terms of the nitrogen that they bring onto beaches. Because they um, lay eggs, when those eggs hatch, the nitrogen that's released actually feeds plants. Those plants then go on to um, support the structure of the beach and actually help prevent coastal erosion. So by nesting on the beaches, they're actually helping prevent coastal erosion. Um, despite all of their brilliance, they are actually all in danger of extinction with the exception of one species that hasn't been classified yet. Threats, um, I mean, it's the same old story for pretty much all marine animals. Um, fisheries bycatch and marine debris are, are decimating um, individual turtles and turtle populations. Um, you're probably all familiar with this image of a turtle having a plastic straw removed from its nasal cavity. This, um, this was an image that went viral. Um, a couple of years ago, it was actually a turtle that was caught in Costa Rica off the Pacific coast, and it actually was the start of the campaign to stop drinking, using uh, plastic drinking straws. So, um, yeah, plastic pollution is a, a serious threat to sea turtles. Climate change, I mean, it's, it's the same story everywhere, isn't it? And coastal erosion, despite the fact that they are supporting their own uh, nesting beaches, climate change and um, coastal erosion is actually causing a lot of problems for sea turtles and sh shrinking the areas that they can actually nest in. Um, on the beaches as well, domestic, um, domestic dogs taking nests, they'll decimate entire nests. Um, this is a real problem. But the big problem that we're going to talk today on the beaches is about poaching. Sea turtles are um, poached across the globe for their shells, for their meat and for their eggs. So what's driving this? Well, depending on where you are, there'll be different kind of opinions about sea turtle eggs, but pretty much everywhere that there's turtles nesting, people will eat their eggs. In some countries, this is a delicacy. In other places, it's just a protein source. In Costa Rica, you ask people why they eat turtle eggs, and they'll just tell you it's their culture. I've always done it. Um, you offer them chickens instead, and they just laugh at you. <laughs> so it's not that they, have, they haven't got alternatives, they just like eating turtle eggs. They've always done it. In the past, people would believe that they had aphrodisiac properties. Today, uh, certainly in Costa Rica, people don't really believe that. They, just, they joke about going to the bar and getting the Viagra because they drink turtle egg shots at the bars, but honestly, they're not, they don't really believe that. It's just something that they like. Um, the people that are poaching aren't necessarily the people that are consuming the eggs. And so there is a trade route from the beach to, to buyers. Um, the people that are buying the eggs, um, sorry, the people that are poaching the eggs are really doing this in Costa Rica so that they can get money to buy drugs. Um, crack cocaine, uh, marijuana and alcohol are the biggest drivers of poaching of sea turtle eggs in Costa Rica. And you can exchange drugs directly for eggs or sell the eggs and buy money, have the money to buy drugs. Couple this with under-resourced, under-motivated like, law enforcement, and you've really got, like, the situation just doesn't, doesn't get any better. So you've got um, some of the strongest wildlife laws in Costa Rica. The sea turtles are protected under wildlife and sea turtle-specific laws, but they're just not enforceable on the ground. And so a poacher will get arrested and be back on the beach in a couple of nights. 
So what's, what's the issue? Where are our knowledge? Well, we know that people are taking eggs out of the beach. On some beaches in Costa Rica, it is as blatant as this. Um, most of the time, though, you go back to the, the following morning after being out on the night patrol, and you'll just find like an empty egg chamber or just evidence that they've been, um, their nest has been poached. So the evidence here, like you don't always see this glaring great hole. Um, sometimes you just get the footprint, there's a handprint here, or there's a stick mark. And that's quite a classic sign that a nest's been poached because what the poachers will do is they will go up the turtle tracks and then get the vague nesting area and then start looking with a stick in the ground, pushing the stick into the, looking for like the soft area. And once the stick suddenly just goes like that, then that's, that's pretty much where the egg chamber is and that's how they can get such a precise digging out of the hole there. The next thing we usually know is that the eggs have arrived in the market. But the problem is what we don't know is what's going on in the middle. We don't know what's happening between the eggs leaving the beach and arriving in the markets. And this is a fairly universal problem. It's not just a situation in Costa Rica. So what if, now stick with me, it's a bit of a jump. <laughs> but what if, just like in Breaking Bad, where the police used a hidden GPS tracker to follow a tanker of chemicals, what if you could do that with a tracking device in a turtle nest? Now, let me introduce you to Paso Pacifico. This is a non-governmental organization in um, California. They're working in Nicaragua where the turtle nest poaching is just insane. Like this, it's so blatant, it's ridiculous. And an absolute genius who works for Paso Pacifico called Kim williams Gian, um was watching Breaking Bad, hence the link, I'm not just making it up. Um, she was watching Breaking Bad and she was like, you could do that, you, you could do that. And not only did she think of this, she actually went ahead and did it um, and put a GPS GSM transmitter inside a 3D printed turtle egg um, and created a prototype to actually try out this, this experiment and see if we could actually start tracking the poachers from the nest to the market. Um, obviously, it needs to look like a turtle egg. And so what you have here is like, she's actually factored in like a dimple there because when you pick up a turtle egg, it's squishy. And when you squish it, you usually leave a dimple in there. So she's factored that in as well. They spent a lot of time with Hollywood special effects artists actually getting the coloration, getting the texture, getting the, the size and the weight right. Um, obviously, there's a couple of glaring holes in it because there's a SIM card port and a charging port. But once those are covered up and painted over, um, your end product looks a bit like this. And they did actually um, arrive in an egg box like that. Um, OK, it still doesn't look that much like a turtle egg, but it doesn't really need to on the way in. What's important is how they look on the way out. And this is a picture of three green sea turtle eggs, and one of those is a uh, fake, and I honestly couldn't tell you which one it is anymore, even though I took that photo myself. Um, so we've got this finished product, but nobody's actually trialed this in real life. They've traveled around with the, with the eggs in, a, in the cars, and they've kind of tried out the technology, and the tracking devices work, but like, in reality, what, what will happen? Will the poachers actually take the bait? Are they safe to use in the event that they're not poached? Will they work? I mean, it's kind of key, right? Um, and also, what other factors need to be considered if you're going to deploy these in real life and actually have an opportunity to start tracking poached nests around the country? And so this is where I got involved. As you can see, my very appealing face here because I was trying to get money out of people. Um, I had to actually fundraise to, to get the money together to buy some eggs. Paso Pacifico basically don't have any because they're an NGO in conservation. Um, and so I got involved and anyone who lent me the money or gave me some money for this campaign, thank you very much. Um, I also needed to go through a huge amount of um, bureaucracy in the form of ethical approval. It was really important that if I was going to field trial these eggs, um, I couldn't have anybody arrested, which seems kind of counterintuitive because I'm also trying to track poachers and but anyway, ethics say no. Um, but then also there's permits in country that were, were required as well. So I've got all of these uh, paperwork in place, everything's ready to go. And then basically it was about finding where I was going to go in Costa Rica to do this trial. And so I started off on the Barra del Colorado uh, Wildlife Refuge working with green sea turtles. The advantage of working with greens is that my, the fake eggs that we were using are exactly the same size and we actually had to put ball bearings in them to make them heavy enough to be um, weighted enough to be a, a green sea turtle egg. 
Um, the disadvantage is that these turtles take a really, really long time to nest. And so you can be sat with a turtle for about five hours waiting for her to, to actually finish laying and go back to sea. We can't just leave them either because if we do that, the poachers will actually take them for their meat. And so we would spend a lot of time, like it took a really long time. Um, Olive Ridley's on the Pacific, so I then got in touch with a couple of organisations and started working over on the Pacific as well. Um, Olive Ridley's are great, they take about 45 minutes to nest and they don't get eaten, so you can just throw an egg in and, and go. Um, the disadvantage is their eggs are quite a lot smaller than a green sea turtle's, and so this was another concern, it's like, how is this, how is this going to work? Once I actually got into the field, the main thing I needed to do was uh, make sure the eggs were up and running. And this was actually quite a complex, um, complex situation. Um, it does require some sort of phone signal on the beach or somewhere so that you can program the eggs. Um, and then they'll either give you a GPS signal, which is ideal, or you'll get an SMS signal, which just will bounce off the nearest phone tower, which may or may not be to your advantage, depending on where those, where those phone towers are. Um, uh, but basically, I spent quite a lot of time like, finding anywhere with a phone signal in the area and text messaging my eggs. Um, here I'm in a motel car park, other times I'm just walking around on the beach, my phone in the air, you know how it is. Um, basically programming all the eggs and getting them set up. Um, I had them set up to emit a signal every hour and learned the hard way that you also have to turn the lights off before you'd want to deploy them because otherwise they light up like a Christmas tree on the beach. Ready to go. And then things just got really weird, like really weird. So we haven't put any eggs out on the beach yet. And what you're looking at here is tracks from like an ATV, like a quad bike, going up to what was a poached nest. So my first thought, and I admit, my first thought was like, poachers, yes, um, because obviously I want to study poaching. But then I'm also wondering why an ATV has gone up there, which is OK, fair enough. But then what they've done is they've basically started filtering through the nest. And like poachers don't leave eggs, all of these white dots are eggs, they don't leave eggs lying around on the beach. So something, something's not quite right. And this didn't happen once, this happened like two or three times. And we're filtering through the nest, what are they looking for? Do they know? Oh. Anyway, so then in the field, and this is applied to both of my field, or both like coastlines, nothing really went to plan. <laughs> we had uh, national strikes, roadblocks, um, petrol shortages, so many injuries, I don't, it's not even funny. Uh, severe weather. When I say severe weather in Costa Rica, I'm not talking about leaves on the track. We're talking like biblical rainfall that meant that this here, this was my entrance to my study site, this is us, and this was eight hours worth of rainfall, which meant that we couldn't actually access this bit of beach that had all the poachers in it. So that was difficult. Um, so then we tried to access it by land. Uh, abject disaster. Right? <laughs> it was expensive and smelly. Um, we had signalling problems on every single beach, but it wasn't consistent, so that kept us on our toes. And then just, you know, you might notice there's not a single track of turtles there. That's because there weren't any turtles, and then there were too many turtles. And then to absolutely put the icing on the cake on every single beach that we went to, literally as we arrived, poachers were arrested for the first time in ages. So, um, yeah. However, however, despite all of this, the show did go on. And my strategy was to encounter a turtle while she's either about to start nesting. Ah, oh, it's just like your... Um, about to start nesting and then approach her from behind. I would then dig a channel so that I could fit my hands and the fake egg into the nest. And it's not meant to flicker like this. But yeah, as you can see, what we would do is actually put an egg into the nest and then carry on, carry on nesting on top of the egg. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so normally this would be taking place in the middle of the night, in the dark. Um, but fortunately, we've got this footage uh, that enabled us to show you what's going on during the day. Now, what I would normally do is I would have a volunteer actually um, put in the egg into the nest on my behalf while I was triangulating the nest. And basically, nest triangulation involves taking three points of vegetation um, in front of your egg chamber. So you've got your turtle nesting, and then you take three measurements. Those three measurements you can then use the following day to come back and actually backwards triangulate it and identify where your egg chamber was. And that's what we're doing here. 
Um, the idea of this is so that you can identify exactly where the egg chamber is without having to give away its location to anybody else. Because even though we want poachers, we don't want them that much. Um, and so what I would do is triangulate the nest, which would enable us to identify whether the nest had been poached or not. My first question um, with this was, are they safe to use? So what we would do is wait until the, um, the hatchlings have actually left the nest and we know that they've, they've definitely gone. And then we would actually go and dig up the, um, the empty eggs or the unhatched eggs and see what the success of the nest was. Now, when I was asking whether these eggs are safe to use, what I wanted to do is basically compare my nests with control nests. And so I was looking for four different variables that I thought could have been affected by having a fake egg in the, in the egg chamber. So hatching success is fairly straightforward. You just count the empty egg shells and compare them. Stage one mortality. So my batteries only really last like maximum of 10 days. And so um, there's no real possibility of them affecting anything beyond the first stage of incubation, which is like this stage. Um, so anything above that. Microorganisms. Um, the best way to tell if an egg has been tested, uh, has been predated by microorganisms, is to smell it. And so, as you can see, this is what's happening here. I don't just look particularly glamorous for a reason. I'm actually um, testing that. If it makes you want to be sick, it's been microorganisms. It's fine. Um, and then, are there any deformities? Are my eggs possibly causing any deformities? It's highly unlikely, but it's definitely worth testing. Um, what I found was that there was no significant difference between the nests with or without a decoy, meaning that they were safe to use. Yeah. But will the poachers take the bait, which is kind of key. So as I said earlier, the olive ridley eggs, um, they're a little bit smaller than the greens. And so this is a fake egg next to an olive ridley. This is a market egg, so it's a bit yellower than they'd actually find it when they're poaching. So we weren't so concerned about that. But the size was, was well, is it going to matter? And what we found was that um, 25 nests were confirmed as poached. Of those, six were discovered and left on the beach. So our poachers are actually quite considerate and like, left our technology lying around for us, which was really very nice of them. Um, and what we found also was that the position that you put the egg in the nest really made a difference to the detectability. And so this was, if you had the egg too high up in the nest, well, the poachers would find it too easily. Or what would happen on the Pacific was that predators would open the nest. And so they just take the top layer of eggs and then expose the, the fake egg. Um, and so we started really burying the eggs deep inside the nest. Um, and then, obviously, they're going to find them at some point, right? So we had some quite amusing examples of when the poachers actually found them a little bit further down the trade chain. Um, and as you can see, what we had here was one of the eggs, we deployed it over here, deployment site. Um, and then it actually um, came online in Guapolis, which was later, that, right, further along than we were expecting. We were expecting it to be around here that we came online and probably get like, consumed there. But it came on, online in Guapolis and then started going north. Um, and then I, it kind of stopped and went offline here. So I was like, oh, let's, go and, let's zoom in, let's have a little look. And basically, uh, the poacher or whoever's bought it has realized that it's not food and chucked it in the river, which is um, not quite as considerate as leaving it on the beach for me, but hey ho. Then we had another situation where the local, um, our neighboring turtle conservation project down the way from us sent me these photos and they were like, do you know anything about this? And I was like, oh, yeah, that looks, that looks kind of familiar. And basically what had happened was the guys that had bought this in an unmet, a town I'm not going to say the name of, they bought this egg and thought that their best option for wondering what it is was to open it up, fair enough. But they were concerned there was a camera inside it, which there's no lens, guys. But then, rather than sort of hiding the fact that they've broken the law and done something naughty, uh, they thought the best course of action would be to send this information to a turtle conservation project, asking um, if this was anything to do with us, and telling us where the eggs were bought, who paid for them, and just gave us a great long list of details about the, the track didn't actually show us, but like the, the, they gave us that information. Also, it's quite obvious they're mechanics. So if this was a real life situation where we were trying to understand a bit more and maybe enforce the law, I'd probably go to the mechanics in that town and start asking around about the, you know, what they've been up to. But uh, we weren't <laughs> able to do that. And then finally, you could do what this guy does and just hand the whole transmitter into the police themselves. Um, the police then got in touch with me and said, I think this might be yours. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's one of my transmitters. And they also found out a lot of information about that guy as well. So 
when poachers give the police your technology, you know that they're not the smartest people in the world. <laughs> What are you going to do? So ultimately, ultimately, did they work? Well, um, as I said, uh, we had 25 nests poached and six of them were discovered. Another 10 were just a mystery. We don't really know what happened to those. It may be that, you know, they came online, but because we didn't have a good enough signal, um, the poachers may have just thrown them in the sea or we just, we don't know what happened to those. And then we had another nine that actually gave us some data. And we got data in two types of, in sort of two formats. One is the point data. And so what we have here is two, two examples. This is the GPS, um, and that's actually given us quite detailed information. Um, and the other one is kind of, this is just where we had quite a few bounce off the, the phone signal. So it's the nearest phone mast is where you get a signal from. What I'm in the current stages of doing is trying to understand if these data that are provided by these timestamps and those, these positions are actually of any use. Um, it may be that there's just been a delay and the information that we're getting from the phone tower isn't that accurate. Or it may be that it's actually, like, if it is accurate, it means that they've come online and that the poachers haven't taken them out of the local area. Um, I mean, for me, that's not actually that useful, but for a future project that maybe isn't in a position to return to the nests and actually check to see if the nest has been poached or not, this could be quite useful information. So. Um, but tracks, obviously, this is what we're really interested in. Um, I've got a few examples here that are quite nice. Uh, this one is uh, an example of where we deployed the egg here, and then it came online and started moving, and then went straight up to the nearest bar, which is only two kilometers away, and stopped. Um, <laughs> so these guys aren't on crack. <laughs> They're alcoholics. <laughs> but what, what happened with this one is actually... Um, we know that this bar is selling turtle eggs. We had to be very careful that we didn't actually go and sort of say anything to them. Um, but what we also found was like after these, the, um, the poachers then started finding the eggs. And so what that tells you is there's not actually that many people who are poaching. And so on this beach, we actually said, okay, cover's blown, fair enough. Um, but either the poachers are talking to each other and so they're in cahoots, or there's just one guy who's poaching, which, again, in a real-life situation, that could be quite a useful thing to know if you actually were going to try and get people arrested. This is another nice, another nice track. Um, it's not so clear on this, unfortunately, but basically we've come in here um, and then deployed the eggs around here. And then if you actually look at the, the, kind of the, the playback on the, um, on the website, it basically, this guy walks up and down the beach, up and down the beach, up and down the beach, and then stops at his house. And so we're pretty confident that we've identified a poacher's house here. And again, I've removed all identifying information, so you can't go around and bop him on the nose, sorry. Um, and finally, this is, this is basically our most successful track, and it's the one that we're most, most happy with. Um, just to put this in context, like every single one of those problems that I mentioned earlier happened this week. So we had like all of the problems, all of the petrol shortages, like it was a nightmare. Um, we weren't going to go out this night. It was the final night. It was a Saturday night. And the only reason I went out and actually put eggs out this night was because I'd inconvenienced everyone so much and um, persuaded them to let me like do something. I couldn't really turn around and go, oh, you know what? Yeah. So anyway, we put, um, we put out um, some eggs. We had 28 turtles nest that night. Um, nothing happened until Monday morning. And then the eggs started to move. And it kept moving. And it, this was the only egg that actually got poached that night. Um, and just so that you can see it in context, that's how far it moved, 137 kilometers inland to a place called San Ramon. So I was obviously ecstatic by this. I was like, Monday morning, I'm watching this egg moving. I'm just like, way, this is happening. And so I think, well, I'll zoom in um, and have a little look at the satellite picture. And I'm looking at it, and it's like 7 o'clock on, on a Monday morning, and there's like this warehouse or some large building. Is it a market? I don't know. And like, but... The person with the egg has gone round the back. This is like some dodgy back alley transaction that's gone on. And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's gone offline. That's, that's kind of, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, I'm really happy that we've identified this trade route already. And then I went to download the data and it had bloody moved again. And so what happened was we're now in a totally different place um, and you can identify the exact building that it's in. Like, so... Once I got petrol again, because I couldn't go straight away, I actually went and investigated these places. And sure enough, like the, the warehouse was a supermarket kind of loading bay. We'd, and they'd done the transaction around the back of the loading bay. 
And then this is a residential area. This is someone's house. And I was so tempted to go knock on the door and ask them anything. But, you know, I decided not to in case they bought me on the note. Um, but, like, this is it. We've done it. We've identified a trade route from the beach, a transaction handover point, and then a residential area. So that was, well, it would have been a champagne moment if we'd had any, but we weren't because we were living on a beach in Costa Rica. But, um, but yeah, it was a good day. So, recommendations for future users. Um, start your deployments earlier than you plan to deploy. But ask your permit, sorry, because you never know what's going to happen. And if all of your poachers get arrested just before you arrive, you're going to have a few um, delays. The species nesting strategy really does make a difference as to how quickly you can um, get your eggs deployed. And you do need to put your eggs deep into the nest. If your eggs are discovered, it's not a reason to panic. Literally, apart from the one example I showed you, on every beach, our eggs were discovered, and then they started moving afterwards, which suggests that there's just more poachers around and people are moving into the area. Um, know your poacher profile. So if your poachers are acting at dawn or at dusk, we had one night where we put 12, nests out, uh, 12 eggs out, and it took us till 3.30 in the morning, and we were absolutely delighted, um, thinking, right, yeah, this will, this will work. And then... Um, yeah, nobody poached anything because they'd all gone home to bed. <laughs> so, alcoholics work earlier than crackheads. <laughs> and know your predator profile. Um, like, for example, I've run the Caribbean. We had dogs. Dogs are the biggest problem. And they actually predate the nests at the end of the incubation period. Whereas raccoons, as cute as they might look, uh, are the bane of your life if they are taking nests at the same time as they're being laid. So you do have to really factor that in as well. So in conclusion, will the poachers take the bait? Sometimes. Sometimes they will. Um, size really doesn't matter, though. The, the olive ridley egg was the one that moved all the way inland, and that's the smaller species egg. So it just got, like, that, that went through at least two different people's hands. Um, we showed that they were safe to work. We showed that they can work. Um, but they, are, they do work better in areas with good phone signal, and that's obviously not ideal if you're working on a nesting beach in remote areas. However, um, as time goes on, like, communication is going to get better, so the beaches will catch up with our technology. Are they cost effective? No. <laughs> like, this was a really expensive project, and at the end of the day, we got like nine data points out of it. But still, one thing I would say, though, is the amount of information that we got that was beyond the tracks was incredible. Like, the amount of reactions that you get from people like, and, and things that you find out. And also, you know, if something sinister was going on and it turns out that all you need to do is have a permit and that will get people to arrest some poachers, then, you know, the knock-on effect of reducing poaching is ultimately what we're aiming for. So finally, what happens next? Well, I'm not going to be involved in this stage, unfortunately, but the data that I've collected and the information, the recommendations will be going on to the next part of the project, which is to trial it in El Salvador. Um, somewhere a little bit more on top, a little bit more risky, a little bit more edgy, but with new challenges and new problems, um, and hopefully more information about making these eggs go from just being something you can trial to actually a law enforcement tool. So, yeah, that's, that's it. I have had so much support for this project. It's been untrue. Um, so this is a really an opportunity to thank all of my funders, all of the people that have helped me on the ground and the projects that have tolerated my incessant pestering to get more teams out on the beach. And also the media coverage has been absolutely incredible. So, and to anyone who's supporting my project as part of Turtle Tracks and sponsored eggs, thank you very much indeed.